keep moving and pivot. So today's webinar, we'll be looking at pivot tables and I'm almost confident that um, I'll be able to dispel the myth that the pivot tables are really complicated. They're really not. And I'm hoping that after this webinar, you'll maybe go back and have a look at some of your existing spreadsheets and maybe give pivots a go to help you analyze your data. So this morning, what, what the topics I'll be covering is a revision of data lists. Data lists need to be structured properly um, before you can actually start using a pivot table. Have a look at creating a pivot table. And then once you've got your pivot table there, being able to sort and filter your data, pivot it round and also group your data. So pivot tables themselves, they're used to um, analyze data that's stored in list form. So quite often you'll have lists with headings across the top and then data underneath. Usually lists with many hundreds or even many thousands of rows going up and down and also many, some often many, many columns of data. And then when you've got your data list like that, analyzing it um, can be quite cumbersome because you don't always need all the columns all of the time and you don't need all of the rows all of the time which then you start putting filters on, taking them off, putting subtotals on, and it's really time consuming. The idea of a pivot means that you can quickly rearrange the data so you can analyze it from different angles. So like just like in netball or basketball, you use pivoting to look around the field of play and analyze it from different angles. Um, with piv normal data lists, you have headings across the top of your spreadsheet. So we've got headings across the top here and then all the data is underneath. Now, with pivot tables, <coughs> excuse me, you can have headings both across the top and also down the left hand side of your data. So, for example, the raw data that we were just looking at there, one big list just with headings across the top. But then that's been pivoted around. So we have headings across the top, headings down the side. In the middle, we have an analysis of the values, so some of the values, it tells us at the top there, and we've got grand totals as well at the, outset of, at the outside of our pivot table. <clears throat> and as you can see, this is a much more compact view than the original raw data. When you're working in pivot tables, you can um, perform all the standard commands. You've got these little drop downs here that you can see. Um, so all your standard sorting and filtering data, you can quickly take fields out of your pivot table, move them around into a different position, change your analysis. So where we've got sum in this example here, you could quickly change it to average without putting any calculations in or count. And you can do your own calculations and it just pivots, just make it easy to identify trends and analyze your data without applying endless filters to lists. Now you can pivot most data lists, um, but pivot tables are most commonly used when um, the list has some kind of repetition to summarize. Um, so for example, we've got some re repetitive data here in these green columns. So the pupil rule appears on multiple occasions. The term is repeated, as is the subject. So one pupil would do um, an exam, a subject, in various different terms. And generally, pivot tables would also um, have data or be based on data that has some kind of value that can be evaluated, for example, totals or averages. Um, I'm just going to exit out of this pivot, that, that particular spreadsheet now. So before we get started and have a look at pivot tables, I just want to have a look at data lists. Um, and make sure that it give, just give you that understanding of how spreadsheets must be organized so that Excel can understand them, read them, and then you can pivot them. So I have um, a table here that's really not structured properly. There's quite a bit wrong with it. Um, by looking at the data that I've got here, I can see that there's um, some cells here, so some different items. And um, we've got some pricing and how much we've got in stock. But because of this blank column here, Excel is looking at this bit of data and thinks it's got nothing in common with this bit of data at all. So blank columns are a bit of a no-no. So I'm just going to right hand click on column C and delete the entire column. 
brilliant. So that's now one big block of data. But same problem, that's one block of data stopping at row 10. And because of the blank row 11, row 12 onwards have got nothing to do with it. So just like I did with column C, I'm also going to delete the blank row 11, giving me one big block of data. Headings in a spreadsheet should always be on the top row of um, the table, not necessarily on row one of the um, spreadsheet. They don't have to be on row one, but if your headings are on row five, then the data should start on row six. And because we've got date received is split into different columns, it would think that received is part of the data. And then Excel would get confused because that's text and these are dates. So I'm just going to change the heading so that I can get rid of that blank column, that blank row, sorry, or that unnecessary row. So we've got the headings at the top row of our table and the data starts immediately underneath. Another thing that um, will confuse Excel and cause problems with a pivot table is merged cells. So call it hit cell H and I5 are merged into one big cell. Merge and center, I can see you switched on. So if I was to add that field into my pivot table, Excel wouldn't know, well, what are you looking at? Are you looking at, yes, it's discontinued or the date it's discontinued. So I'm just gonna turn merge and center off. Every column really needs a heading and this should be unique, just so it avoids confusion. And there we go, um, in here, we're, our data list is now perfect. So we've got no blank rows, no blank columns, Headings are on row one, no merged cells. Oh, there's a bit of an error there though. That's a, like a user error, I think. So Excel wouldn't be able to add that up. So I'm just gonna change it. And if you're wondering about, about blanks, then these blank cells here are not a problem. It's not an entirely blank column and they're not entirely blank rows. So blanks are absolutely fine. <clears throat> All right, so now that we've um, got our spreadsheet as we want it to look, I'm just gonna move over to the results worksheet. So this is quite a small, smallish worksheet, I suppose, only four columns with the repetition. So we've got different pupils doing different exams in different seasons, different terms with the results at the end. If I just quickly jump down to the bottom, so there's over 160 rows in here for me to sort and filter and do any kind of analysis. So I'm going to use a pivot table. Before you start creating your pivot table, you really need to plan it, even if that's just a, a thought in your head for a second or two. So basically, what do you want the pivot table to tell you? What do you need to know from the pivot table? Because when we, I often hear people saying pivot table's not, not right. Well, if it's not right, then pivot it around so it is right or change it so it is right. But saying it's not right doesn't help. What do you want it to do? So have a little bit of planning and know exactly the data that you want from your pivot table. So now we've got this data and, and I know it's absolutely fine. I want to pivot the data around. So here we go. I'm going to create a first pivot table now. Because this is one big block of data, I don't have to highlight it but I do need to click somewhere inside the data. So clicking in a blank cell is not gonna help Excel. So I'm just gonna click within the data. And because I'm putting something into the spreadsheet, I'm gonna have a look on the insert ribbon tab. And the very first command is to insert a pivot table. So the create pivot table dialog box, question number one, where are you get any data from? So as you can see from the marching ants, Excel has highlighted the whole table range around the cell that I had selected and confirms the, the range in here, which is correct. You could use an, an external data source, so it might be a spreadsheet that's elsewhere. Um, so you want your pivot in one spreadsheet and the data's held elsewhere, or it could be an access database, but that's fine with me. Whereabouts do you want the pivot table to go? Well, we'll put it on a, a new worksheet. You could put it on an existing worksheet. So for example, I might say, put it there, please. But for this example, I'm gonna put it on a new worksheet. So in essence, really, I've clicked on create pivot table and I haven't actually changed anything in here. So I'm just gonna click okay. Right, here we go. When you create, um, when you create a new pivot table, <clears throat> 
you get almost like this foundation, this sort of like foundation area here to build your pivot table on. You also get on the ribbon additional tools, so contextual tools. You're working with a pivot table, so you might need the analyze tools or the design tools. Now, if you click away from your pivot table into a cell, if you're not working with a pivot table, you clearly don't need the contextual tools. If you're looking for them and they're not there, just click back inside your pivot table and they'll come back up again. So the two tabs, the design tab is um, about making your pivot table pretty, but the analyze tab is about getting that structure and getting the data correct. There's three commands at the right of this, um, the analyze ribbon tab, field list, plus minus buttons and field headers, and they're already switched on, they're all highlighted in gray. The field list is this panel down the right hand side of your screen, and this is where you will build and structure your pivot table. When you finish with your pivot table, just to give you a bit more screen space, you might want to switch it off. And then if you needed to change the structure of your pivot table, you can switch it on. So just like a light switch, it's either on or it's off. In the field list, you'll notice the headings that were in our table are displayed here as what Excel calls fields, so like fields of data, a little bit like driving around the countryside where you see a field of cabbages or a field of lettuces. These fields can be added into my pivot table in one of these four areas, values, columns, filters and rows. So rows display across, columns display down and the values display at the intersection of a column or a row. And then you've got high level filters that you can place on the whole pivot table. So let's have a look at um, what we can do with a pivot table. So ultimately from my data, I want to analyze the test results. So I'm just gonna place a tick in test results. Now notice how um, Excel assumed, because that's a, a numerical field, it's got numbers in it, in that column. Excel has decided, well, probably the best place for that to go would be for the values, and I'll automatically sum them for you. Perfect. So we've got a sum of the test results, which is 2653. It's great. It didn't really give me any depth as to where do those figures come from. So I could look at this data and say, OK, so we achieved 2653. But what did we get for each subject? So if I tick, on, tick subject, now Excel has assumed that subject wants to go in the rows area. So the subjects go across each row in the pivot table. And the values are now broken down. So I've still got that grand total of 2653, but I can see the breakdown for each of the subjects. I'm just gonna take that tick out. What about term? So it's taken subject away from rows and put the term in instead. And if I untick term and tick pupil, I get a breakdown by pupil, still with that grand total of 2653. And what you really need to remember about pivot tables is that they're based on an underlying data source. So it's based on this underlying data in this results worksheet, but it's not touching it. So if at any point I was to think, actually, this just isn't working, I just delete the sheet. You haven't actually touched the underlying data. That's safe. So going back to the fields and structuring our pivot table, <clears throat> um, we, yes, we can tick to add fields in and take them away to, from our pivot table. But by using tick, Excel has all it's done is put things in the rows area and the values area and ignored the columns and ignored the filters. So where we had the pupil in the row area, so the data is displayed horizontally, so it's going across rows. I can take that field and with the four headed arrow, I can just drag it into the column area. So the columns are now going down in the spreadsheet as opposed to going across. Same data, same subtotals, same grand total. It's just a slightly different layout. And that's the idea of pivot, just move it around. So I can drag the pupil back into the rows area and I can use both of these if I want. So let's say I want to take the term and I'm gonna drag it into the columns area. And now we've got one of those two dimensional columns. So if I, I can follow spring down and I can follow Davies across to find the spring result for Davies, a grand total at the side for the whole of Davies, 
a grand total at the bottom for the whole of spring and a grand grand total for the whole thing, that same total, 2653. And there we have pivot tables. The only area I haven't used at the moment is the filters area. So I'm going to take the term and put it into filters. And I'm going to take the subject and put it into the columns area. So the, using the filters, it creates like an overarching filter for the whole pivot table. So any filters that I apply using the filters area will affect the entire pivot table underneath. So for the term, I can either display all of the terms or just spring. Notice how the grand total has changed now that we're just looking at spring. Or I can display just summer. Grand total's changed again. Or you can even put a tick in the box so that you can select multiple items. So I want spring and summer. And it tells me you've got multiple items here. Or I can go back to seeing all of the data. So those are the different areas of a pivot table, how to add fields in. You can take fields away either by unticking them or you can just drag them away. Notice the little cross underneath the mouse, just let go once you get the cross and you can take them away just as easy. So we're going to be using that quite a bit this morning. Michelle, I will answer that question, by the way. I will come back to that. So refreshing your data. I can see here. <clears throat> excuse me, that for English, Ashley has a total for spring, summer and autumn, a, a total of 60. Now, I know that that's wrong. It should be 70. As I mentioned earlier, you can't ruin a pivot table. And if I try and type now, so I'm just going to try and type 70. And as soon as I type a number or anything, to be honest, <clears throat> Excel tells me it can't change this part of a pivot table. You can't change the values because they're coming from the underlying data source. So if you're wanting to change the data, you have to intentionally go back to the data source. I'm going to go back to results. Ashley Summer for English, I can see the total there is 12. That's where the problem is. It should be 22, not 12. Now, this is the underlying data source and I can change it. And if I go back to sheet one, you would have expected that to change, updated to 70. But it's a little bit like when you're on a web page, if you're, I don't know, looking at cricket results and you might refresh it every now and again to make sure that you've got the, the most up to date results in front of you. It's the same thing with a pivot table. So I'm going to go to the pivot table tools, analyze tab, and I'm going to ask Excel to refresh the data. And there we go. We get that 70 and the grand total have all updated. So just remember to update your pivot table or to refresh it if the, any of the underlying data has changed. <clears throat> if you close and open your, your spreadsheet, it refreshes on open as well. So remember that refresh. So I talked this morning about um, sorting and filtering. So people do on spreadsheets, do sorting and filtering an awful lot, and you can do the same in a pivot table. So you could use the drop down arrows uh, actually on the pivot table. So I can sort Z to A by name. The column labels, I could sort Z to A by those as well. You can use um, sorting on a right hand click. So I want, might want to sort by the maths results. And I want to sort those largest to smallest. So the names are mixed up now because they're organized by results. And you can even sort sort of horizontally using a pivot table. So I'm going to right click and sort that A to Z, English to science. So that's one way of sorting data. So or two ways, right hand click or using the drop down arrows. If on the, um, we talked about these three buttons on the ribbon being switched on and off. If I turn field headers off, then it takes away the sorting options. It depends on your requirements as to whether you want those on. Right click will still work. Alternatively, you can hover over um, the, the, the field name in the field list and use the drop down arrow and sort from here as well. So all sort options 
up to you. Use the drop down arrows, use the field list, use right click, mix and match, it's your call. Same thing with filters. So filtering data out, and this will affect that grand total. So I'm just wanna be left with um, my functional skills, English and maths. So from my column labels, I'm gonna filter out everything and just be left with English and maths. Again, you can do this on a standard spreadsheet. So we've just got the English and maths results with those grand totals. And I want to take away, um, I'll just take Ashley away for the time being. And again, the grand total changes. You can filter in your field list and you actually get an indicator in your field list over here to show you that you've filtered by that specific column. So you can apply filters here. I'm just gonna clear the filter from subject and I'm gonna clear the filter um, from the pupil as well. So we've got all the data back again. And as I mentioned, if you wanted that overarching filter, use the filters area of your pivot table and then you can filter out and just display one item or multiple items in here. Right, <clears throat> I'm gonna just do um, a slight change of this pivot. I'm gonna pivot it round and change the structure of it slightly. I'm gonna take the term away, so I'm just gonna drag that away, I don't necessarily need it. And I'm gonna take away the subject as well. So I've got a nice simple pivot table showing me the total per pupil and the grand total overall. So that's Ashley for all of the exam results for all of the terms. So just uh, in your head, keep that number in mind, 2663. But I don't want to see um, all of the exam results. I just want to see English. I don't want to put the subject on the pivot table. I don't need that. So without adding subject into my pivot table, I'm gonna click on the drop down arrow. I'm gonna take everything else away and display just English and okay. Right, so filter applied. It looks like there's a filter applied. But look at that grand total. It didn't change. This can't possibly be right. It, it can't be a grand total for all subjects and then be the same for English. That can't possibly be right. So um, I'm going to have a look at why that is. It's because the field isn't actually applied in the pivot table. It isn't in the pivot table. If I add it in, that's better. So it's 530, not 200 and 2663. But I don't want the column on my pivot table. I do a sign out like a demanding. Um, so I'm going to remove the filter from the subject, seeing as it wasn't doing anything anyway. And I want to show you another a feature that you can use for filtering. So we have what are called interactive filters. So looking at the Pivot Table Tools Analyze tab, there's a group of filter commands here, and we have an option to insert a slicer. Now a slicer is like an interactive filter. So I want to put a slicer for the subject and OK. Right, clearly now, um, I can see all the options available to me. They're all highlighted in blue, which means I'm looking at all of them. Well, I just want English. So I just click on English and the total changes. What about just French? That changes. What about humanities? Brilliant. What about all of them again? So if I clear the filter, got them all back. Um, and if I wanted just English, I can use my control key. So I'm gonna hold control down now and click maths. So I've got both of those and they're highlighted. Clear the filter. Or I might want French to maths, including humanities. So control will let you pick individually, whereas shift lets you sort of sandwich together a group of entries. So these interactive filters are great if you're ever doing any presentation. So first of all, it shows people the options that are available which you don't get to see really in, in a drop down list. And it's so um, obvious what, what's selected um, and it, it just makes it quite nice and so quick to apply the filter. And because slices are an object, they have their own tools on the ribbon. Um, so just run through some of the quick commands that we've got in here. So you can put flashy colors on them. 
if there's let's say there might be 20 subjects i might want to display the buttons in two columns might be a little bit easier to see i can resize the slicer i can move it around and i can either do that manually or i can use the buttons on the ribbon um, and i could change the button size or the size of the box as a whole so those are the slicer options and I'm just going to click away from that and you'll notice that they then disappear. So just to repeat what I did there was just clicked in the pivot table. I want to be able to filter by term as well, um, but I don't want to put the term on the pivot table. So I'm going to go to the analyze tab. I'm going to insert a slicer on the term and OK. And it plonks it sort of slap bang in the middle of your screen. So I'm just going to move it around so that it looks like the other one and maybe choose a different colour. And now I can mix and match my filters. So I can click on spring. So I've just got spring for maths. Or I might want spring and summer. So I'm going to use control for maths and science. Or I might want all of the terms but just for science and maths or i might want all of the subjects but just for autumn and it just makes applying those filters um really easy what do you think to the slicers guys just use your questions box is that something you think you could utilize okay um they are really useful um so we've got a pivot table here. I'm quite happy with this one. I've only created one pivot table so far. So I'm going to go back to my original data source. And I'm going to click inside the results sheet. And again, just to confirm to create a pivot table, I'm going to insert a pivot table. The data is right. Yes, it can go on a new worksheet and click OK. I'm going to tick the test results or drag the test results again so that it goes in the values area. But with this particular pivot table, I want to talk about grouping, grouping data, because you do this an awful lot with pivot tables. My spreadsheet only has four fields in it. You quite often find that your spreadsheets, like I said earlier, have got many, many, many columns in them and grouping is really important. So grouping data, if I add in the, um, let's say the pupil into the row area now there's quite a bit of room in here which suggests that you can use it over and over again so if i also get hold of the term and drag it underneath the pupil so still in the rows area we've now got pupil first subdivided by term so ashley has a total of 310 and that's subdivided down by these three figures one for each term next pupil subdivided down and again it's just a way of pivoting the data around so that's not quite right really this time i'm going to drag the pupil and drop it underneath the term so just swapping those two fields around now i can see in autumn it's subdivided down by each pupil and spring and summer with that same grand total down at the bottom and let's have a go at putting the subject in the column area. So now we have all of the data from the results worksheet, but in such a more compact form with the headings across the top and down the side. Now grouping, you can group um, items in your row area. I'm gonna take the term now and drop it underneath the subject in the columns area. The subject being on top, so each subject, English, and we've got an English total, is subdivided down then by each term. French is subdivided down by each term. Or the other way around, so let's just drag subject and just pivot them round. So now we've got each term subdivided down by each subject. So that's the idea of um, grouping data. We just take the term away for the time being. And um, I want to have a look at a little bit on uh, drilling down on data. <clears throat> so drilling down on the data that we've got here, because I've taken the term away, um, Ashley for English, that is a total for all terms. 
So it doesn't really tell me what I did in autumn or spring or summer. It's a collective total for all of the terms. So if I wanted to see, well, just for Ashley, just for English, how's that data? How's that number 70? How's it broken down? Just take a look at the sheets I've got at the bottom of here for a second. <clears throat> it's only for four sheets, two sheets that I'd start with and these two new pivot tables. If you double click on an, a value within a pivot table, so I'm just going to double click on this Ashley value, watch my worksheets. So Excel has now created a separate sheet and showing me just the data for Ashley for, um, for English. So he's got his spring and his summer and his autumn, all of those adding up to 70. Now that is the equivalent of going to the results worksheet, filtering it out. So you've just got Ashley, just got English, copying what's left and putting it on the new sheet. But all I did was double click. So going back to my pivot table, I could have a look at the humanities total. So we've got 550 for humanities for everybody. So how was that broken down? Double click another new sheet so that's all the humanities totals go back to my pivot table and maybe on um, the grand total for a pupil double click and that's their total great i suppose if you were doing like a um open night at school you could just separate those out one for each of your pupils in seconds which is great so we have our little pivot tables here um, and all of these, those ones that I've just double clicked to extract are, autumn, are, are ultimately a copy and a paste from the results worksheet, just copy and paste only. So in these separate sheets, I can change these values and it won't have any impact on that underlying data source. OK, just got a question in. If you add data to your new to your results worksheet, does it go into the pivots automatically? It will go into the pivots automatically. So let's put a ridiculous amount in there. Let's actually 100. If I go back to my pivot table, that can't be right. So I'm going to have to refresh the data. And it changes. However, because these are like copied and pasted, there is no refresh. I would have to go back and pull that data in. So, yes, even if it's added to the bottom of the range. Good point. Right. So this particular pivot table I've got here, I've got four fields, pupil term, subject and test results. On my results worksheet, I'm going to add in an exam column. So bearing in mind when I created the pivot table, that was the data range. It finished at column D and it finished at row 168. I'm going to add in um, exam date and I'm just going to quickly put some dates in here just uh, so that we've got something to play around with. And I'm also going to go to the bottom OK, so my data initially when I created the pivot table finished at row 168 and finished at column D. Omitting those new areas that I've just added in. So if I go back to sheet two where my pivot table is and refresh the data. Well, no Joe appears in here and there's no date that appears in here. So what you may need to do, because that was outside of the defined range, still with the data source, is go and change the data source. And you can see the marching ants here. It stopped. So if I just change that column D to a column E, and it now finishes at row 169 instead of 168, I can now use the exam date and Joe appears in the list, not with a great result. So you may need to just check and, if necessary, change your data source if you're adding data to your original data source. Does that help, Joe? 
Okay, I want to do a little bit more on calculations. Um, and I'm going to go into a spreadsheet called Stock Report. So um, I think we're sick of seeing those exam results. So this is a little bit more like the data that you get to see lots and lots of columns. And uh, how many rows have we got in here? Over 2,000. So really unwieldy to manage on your own. And I want to have a look at the values specifically with this one. So it's structured correctly. I'm going to click inside um, the data and I'm going to insert a pivot table. The data range is right. I want it on a new worksheet and OK. <coughs> Excuse me. Just a simple structure that I'm going to have with this one. I want the price to be the value. So we've got that overall total in here. I'm going to put the category names in the rows area. And I'm going to add in the discontinued. Is it discontinued? Yes or no in the columns area. And we can see in the middle, these for beverages, there's 16,915 that's not discontinued, but we've got stock of 315 quid that is discontinued. So we've just got the numbers here. And in the top right hand corner, Excel shows me that it's doing a sum of the price. Um, maybe I don't want that, maybe I want to do averages. In a normal spreadsheet, that'd be up to you then to put the formula in. But in pivot tables, if I just have a look at where this value field is placed in the pivot table, so it's in the values area, and it's showing me a sum of the price. If I use the drop down arrow and change the settings for this values field, and simply change it to an average, and there we go. I might then want to change the average to a count or change it back to a sum. Not particularly keen on this formatting. I mean, you can just format using your home tab on your ribbon as standard. Um, alternatively, if I go back to value field settings, I can change the number format for this particular pivot table, whatever's in the value field. I think I'll have it currency displayed to two decimal places with an English pound sign. OK and OK, it's better. But pivots are, are, are just so flexible and they can just do so much with the calculations. So, um, for example, here we've got column total down at the bottom, 66, 666.42.8. So, 66 grand, 66 and a half grand is the total ish. I want to know <clears throat> if beverages is 16,915, what percentage is that figure of the overall grand total? And what percentage is that figure of the overall grand total? And that one. And you probably sat there thinking now, oh no, not percentages, I'm going to have to put the calculations in myself. You really don't need to. I'm going to go back to the value field settings and the summary data is fine I still want to sum it but I need to show the values as something other than just a total so if I go to show values as it says no I've got I ain't got any calculation there at the minute you've just got a sum well I would like to show the value as the percentage of the grand total you're not even thinking about a formula you're just picking something from a drop down list click OK and there we go. So that 16,000 is 21.5% of the 66.5 grand grand total. 84% is uh, not discontinued, 15 is with a grand total of 100. And we even get the grand grand totals. So if we um, go back into our value field settings, and show value as. I could do the same thing as a percentage of the column total. So the other way around. And finally, to set it back to how it was, just show value as and change it to no calculation. Now, normally, obviously, in our standard classroom based training sessions, we'd spend a little bit more time on this, uh, but we've only got 45 minutes, so just um, showing you as much as I possibly can. 
um, formatting pivot tables, <clears throat> maybe thinking about um, formatting the pivot table. Oh, hang on. Laura's just said, can you do both a percentage and an amount? Yep, before I move away from here. So we've got the sum of the price in here. Got the price in again. So I've got the price and the price too. So it's basically it's displayed twice on one of them. It doesn't matter which one, I don't suppose. The value field settings. I'm going to show the value as a percentage of the um, column total. So we've got both the total and the percentage. Does that, is that okay? Is that what you're asking as well, Matthew? Can you do a mix of grand total stain, but permanently of the dollar months and percent? I think that's, oh, which sheet was I on then? Wrong workbook altogether, sorry. I think that's what you were asking as well, isn't it, Matthew? I think. Perfect. So, yeah, just add your field in as many times as you want. You can do as much analysis as you like. And like I say, with a pivot table, try it because you're not affecting your underlying data. You've not done anything to it. You just tried a few bits out on your pivot table. Worst case scenario, didn't work. Take it away. But we'll leave that on there. So to finish off with, I'm going to do a little bit of formatting. So I'm going to go back to my original data source and insert final pivot table on a new worksheet. I'm going to do a bit of grouping on this one. So I want the category name and also the English name at the left. So we've got that beverages separated down by each of the products. Um, I also want to know whether it's discontinued or not. So that can go in the column area. So my yeses and my noes. But this time I want to know how much I've got in stock. So I'll do units in stock and have those totals in here. So Quite a lengthy pivot table, but it's quite detailed and very easy to follow. If I click in my pivot table, so with the analyze tab has got all the, the tools in here for structuring your pivot table, whereas design is making it pretty. So we've got a whole host of built in styles here that we can choose. Some are better than others. Once you've got a style that you like, then you can switch on or switch off the style options. So row headers are switched on. If I turn that off, I actually preferred those being switched on. It was easier to see. Column headers, these column headers here. Yep, yeah, they're better on. A banded rows will put some kind of formatting to draw your attention going horizontally across the spreadsheet. And banded columns will draw your attention vertically. Sometimes you can put both banded rows and banded columns on. OK, yes, yes, I do, Joseph. I'll get back to you. Though. OK, so we have the design tab here. Um, when I first started using pivot tables, I, I got quite confused, actually, because I was looking at the figures. And I was looking at the total at the bottom, thinking that was the total for the figures above, because I'm used to seeing totals at the bottom of a range, but that's not how pivot tables work. It puts the subtotal at the top. So if you find that problem, then on the format tab, so the design tab with subtotals, you don't have to have them at all, so don't show them. They are at the top of each group at the moment, so I'm just gonna change them and put them at the bottom of a group. So to me, that's a little bit more logical, might not be to you, you can also, these grand totals, so we've got a grand total in the last column of the pivot and also the last row. You don't have to have those on. So grand totals off for rows and columns or on for rows and columns, just for the rows, just for the columns. I'm going to turn them um, off. So no grand totals now. There's different layouts for your report. So if we have a look at compact layout or showing outline form, and maybe repeat your labels, uh, tabular form. I haven't really done anything with a pivot table, it's just how do you like it to look? And uh, with blank rows, we can insert 
<coughs> a blank line after each item. That looks quite nice, actually, particularly if you're reading on the screen. Or you can remove that blank line. Um, and I think from what we set out to do today, um, there's that's pretty much covered everything. Like I say, we would go through with that in an awful lot more detail uh, on our actual training sessions and hopefully have you doing something more interactive. <coughs> Excuse me. If you, if you want to bear with me, there's a couple of questions in the questions panel. I'm just going to refer to these and make sure I've covered everything um, before we go. So if you've got any questions now, do you want to just put them in the questions box and I'll go through them? So what happens if new data is added at the bottom of the master source? Is it what, so we went through that, didn't we? You might need to um, refresh your data and if it doesn't appear, maybe change your data source. So that's that. So Mags uh, just tried to create a pivot table on the results tab, but it's come back with data source references not valid. I would recommend going back to your original data, make sure you clicked inside it, and when you insert your pivot table, just double check that it's picked up the right range. It's, if you clicked outside your data, and you insert a pivot table, there isn't anything for it to show, so you may get an, an error there. Or sometimes if you've got two or more cells selected, that causes a problem as well. So just one cell inside your pivot. Can you do both percent and amount? So we went through that, didn't we? Um, Matthew, is that what you were asking too? I think, I'm not sure whether it was. Uh, so Tim, you were going to ask the same as Laura with the... In the same column? No, because you'd have your column totals at the bottom. Peter's calling it a blackout of pivot tables. I don't think they are. I think people who create them make them look complicated. But if you're doing your own from scratch, um, I think you know it's it's logical. It's, it's your data. As long as you know what you want before you start, you'll know whether it's right when it, when you've done it. So, um, yeah, absolutely. So Lee's just asking, can you rename your heading? Um, let's go back to this one. No. Some of units in stock is just a cell. You can type whatever you want in it. So just over type it, it's just a cell. Okay, I think I've answered all questions now. Um, so I just say thank you all for joining. Thanks for attending. Um, and hope to see you on other webinars soon. We haven't got any running next week because of other commitments, but we're hoping to put some more on in future. You know what my email address is. If you need any help, support or guidance going forward, please do just drop me an email. And uh, thanks again for attending. Keep safe, guys, and hope to see you again soon. Take care. Bye.